Thank you, and thanks to Creative Mornings Vancouver, thanks to uh, GVPTA, and um, let's get this party started. Um, I just want to tell you what is going on tonight. So um, we're going to hear from each person that's on the, the panel tonight. They'll each give you a presentation through the lens that Mark was talking about. Um, I'll introduce them before they come on. Then we'll have a break of about seven or eight minutes where we would love for you to have your own conversation. Um, turn to somebody that you don't know beside you, um, talk amongst yourselves about what kind of rang true with you, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you agree with, what you didn't agree with. Then we'll come back and I will sort of host a little panel discussion here, but it's different from most panel discussions that you usually see. So we will be getting you to ask the panelists questions. I'll be asking them questions. Hopefully they'll be asking each other questions and we'll have a, a bit of a conversation. That would be the ideal. So we're, we're here for you. We wanna get creative ideas flowing and um, hopefully it'll be an interactive time um, during that conversation. So the first presenter that I will call up here is Yvonne Wallace, and she's from the Lilwat Nation. Um, she's a recent graduate from the Bachelor of Liberal Arts degree program at Cap University, and she told me she's going to introduce herself a little bit more in detail. But first I want to tell you three kind of uh, trivia pieces about Yvonne. Her grandmother had 13 children, and she is the youngest granddaughter. Her nickname in theater school was Loops. Very, very happy, very, very sad. Her favorite thing to eat in the whole world, salmon cheeks, yum. So please give a warm welcome to Yvonne. Kukstam Kalap. I'm just going to introduce myself in my language. Inchesh uhua muks squachi cha palamuta swell. Inchesh squachi antwash rushish. Inchesh squachi shamach Yvonne Wallace. Statlium can. My name in uhua muks is well, and that means to always be left behind. My second name that I grew into is Rushish, and that means rough waters, and I'll explain to you why. But thank you. My name is Yvonne Wallace. I am, um, I self-identify as Indigenous. That's my life experience. I was raised by my grandmother, and I'm sure that across the world, grandmothers hold a dear, dear place for everyone in this room and for our community especially. My grandmother, Catherine Pascal, she was a master weaver, a cedar basket weaver. And as we mentioned earlier, she had 13 children. And I believe by the time I was eight, I had 185 cousins. So I had a lot of people to love me. My grandmother was a fluent speaker um, in Uchomiuksh. And she was with my grandfather. And um, her mother, Mahayaksh, Matilda, she was over 100 years old when I was four. And Matilda would speak to me in Uhuamiuksh. And I would reply in English. It was her act of decolonization. It was, it was her proud act to refuse to speak English and to conform to general society. When I was born, I was born uh, three months premature. Uh, in our community, 
If there is um, a funeral process or a process of grieving, the a mother carrying child is refused to go to the to the grave to the graveyard or to the grieving process. So, my mother, through great grief, had me three months early. Story number one, from my grandmother. She told me that I was a fighter. So because I had spent three months in an incubator, she named me Swell. Swellston is the fall time, and Swell is to be left behind, to fall behind. So she would call me Little Swell. So I was in an incubator for three months. Yes, a tumultuous start, I realize. So on restart, how do I claim an, a cultural identity that is so tumultuous? How do I claim personal identity when my culture is losing the language? When 120 years ago, 100% of my people spoke Uchwalmiuksh, and today, there are 23 fluent speakers of 2,500 people. So that's me in 1979, beside the teacher, bright-eyed, imaginative, and for most part, happy. But what you wouldn't know about me in that picture is that all of my siblings are at residential school. My mother, her first marriage, she became a widow, sadly. And the court ordered my mother to send away my siblings to residential school. So again, I was always left behind. So every um, September, my siblings would leave me. And then they would return in June. I was a light-skinned baby, and I stood out from the rest. In 1990, the picture to the right, you can see me singing with um, Jim Cuddy from Blue Rodeo at the Stein Valley Watershed Festival. I had an idea. I wanted to sing with Blue Rodeo, and so I did. So that year, I told my English teacher that I really like this performing thing. I think I want to do it. So he started a um, designed program for theater just for me in my all First Nations community. And I sat right over there to one of my very first shows in 1990. So I'm very grateful to be invited here today. The picture on the left, you see, that's the lake. That's the lake where I wrote my story, Uchsen. Uchsen means to make something better. We had transformers across our lands who would go over mountains from lake to lake, and they would keep the people in order. They would um, delineate parcels of land which parts we were to take care of and which parts we were visitors to. And we, for most part, respected each other. But an Utsimath, a transformer, they were higher beings. And me, being a mere mortal, I wrote my play as Utsen to make things better. This is my home. In the bottom corner, I'm in my red dress. I have best of both worlds, a lesson taught to me by my grandmother. I have the white world and the brown world, and I'm in a good position because I can gain an education. And she went to grade two level, but she taught me many things. What you don't know is the person who's handing me my diploma, his name is Harry, he's also 
a residential school survivor. And he's also a hero of mine that you may never meet. After I graduated high school, I moved on to pursue theater. I went to Capilano University College at the time, and then I moved to Toronto, and I went to the Kimbercote Farm, the Native Theater School, which was a six-week intensive with First Nations people all across Canada. And we did a collaboration. And of course, I used my grandmother's voice to contribute. I participated at Humber College in the theater arts program. I, I paid my dues. I was a Portuguese ghost. I played a tree, <laughs> pretty much everything. I played an Italian mother. And that experience was wonderful. I even waited for Godot, but it didn't talk about my personal experience. I didn't feel represented, but I made my home where I could, and I found family in my peers. So it was a good thing. I graduated from Humber with the most outstanding body of work, and my teachers would tell me that it was my ability to be natural, and that it was my ability to connect. But I believe it was my ability to want better for my peers. When there was a scene or we performed to the best of our ability, it was because I gave to them and they received. And that was my biggest accomplishment, I feel. So here we are. Thirteen years later, I, t I took a leave. I have a 13-year-old daughter. I raised her. I had, um, I had an agent. I, I did the touring about the country. I did dance. I did song. And again, a lot of the stories didn't feel like they represented me. And it was exhausting. $300 a week on a non-equity gig. It's kind of hard to pay the bills. So I went back to university. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I entered into the Liberal Studies Bachelor of Arts program. What I didn't mention earlier is that in elementary and high school, I had learned Uhuamuk, which is my first language from the young age of three until 17. So for 14 years, I learned disconnected words, one at a time. We have about 6,200 words in our dictionary. And I probably learned about 1,000 in that time. So from the time I left home to 2013, we're talking 20 years. And I had a conversation with my mother who is a language teacher. And I asked her, Mom, how many people are speaking now? Because when I was young, there was about 400. And she said, well, there's about 50. And as I mentioned now, we're approaching 20. So my need to um, gain fluency is urgent. So this is my story. I wanted to take my theater background and my love of language and combine the two, and so I did. I found three professors who would help me do that. One helped me to write down monologue. Another helped me to script it, create characters, create the world of the play. And my third was my language teacher. And she had spoken to whom and I transcribed. So that was a pretty powerful moment that I could write my language free form with just listening to her. So in the play, 
Auntie Celia, the one who took care of me, she refuses to speak English, just like my great-grandmother. Oh yeah, and this is a one-woman show. I get to play all six characters. How fun is that? Auntie Celia refuses to speak English. So, in disconnected communication, we have to figure out what each, what each of us is saying. Now, in a very exciting time where truth and reconciliation is upon us, this is very exciting for me that the university allowed me to have a graduating project use my first language. And not only that, they went one step further and the language requirement, I didn't have to go and relearn a new language, not Spanish, not French, not German, but they allowed me to use my Uhu Mux credits for the language requirement. So as far as indig indigenizing the academy goes, that's pretty profound for me. My story started with the word in scout. In scout was one word that came to me one day. I just opened the book and I pointed to a word. And in scout means to cry or scream uncontrollably. But in the little brackets, it said early morning. This one word informed me that our people had a process not a prayer, but a process of letting go. And so I walk around and I ask my friends, what does this mean in the early morning? When we grieve our people, we have four days of grieving, we lay them to rest, we burn their belongings, and we send them on a good way. But what do we do with the people who are left behind? Well, we go out in the early morning and we cry and we scream uncontrollably. In the early morning is when the spirits are least likely to wander. Isn't that beautiful? Think about it. If we have a land where the people are so connected, we think about their lives in the afterworld too. Another word that I discovered in my writing was Inqualutinch. And that means my language is coming back from memory. Now you have to remember that when we develop a language, it takes about 5,000 years to develop a language. So the urgency to keep some, some, a system of knowledge and remembering alive is very important. In Kolutinj, my memory is coming back to me. So, I wrote this play, I presented it, protocol, to my elders. I spoke Uhuamuj to my elders, and they understood me. I had 15 elders with walkers in the front row. I had all three of my language teachers from elementary to high school, my mother included. And I had high school language learners. And there were 70 of us in a small studio. And I shared my story. It was very, very awakening and happy. But it was a tragic story. I was invited back to the Truth and Reconciliation Week and I presented in the Blue Shore Theater. And 200 people came to that show. So I now went from 70 people to 200 people. And again, it was overwhelming the support that I received. This one woman show with six characters speaking three different languages. The word got out, the back door happened. I was no longer looking for funding to funding bodies because as we all know, that's quite competitive and 
who has enough time to manage all of that, right? So I was invited by the Whistler Community Society to do a one-woman show of four viewings for the world premiere in Whistler on February 2019. From there, I have some support to do, further develop my play. And I went to Native Earth Performing Arts last week with another indigenous dramaturg and revisited a friend from 20 years ago. And next week, I'll be participating with the Playwright Center. So having said that, my restart happened when I decided to go back to that little girl who was always left behind. I decided to give voice to the person that you may not know exists. The person with a settler society and an indigenous society. And we barely hear their stories. But I can tell you that it was a tumultuous one. I'm going to share with you a last of my script, and thank you for coming out tonight. I really appreciate your attention. You've been wonderful for hearing me talk. So Margaret says, OK, so this is the day I'm forced to think in Uhlamuksh. Lucy, the nurse, told me that my cousin Jeff has been here, but he couldn't stay. He suggested that the nurse call me to deal with this. OK, I'll do my best. Can't lu wa alsum. Lan wa chiuch. Lech lech kauch. Papala wit i uhwa miuch. Muta ti temiuchwa. Get ready. Your visit lifts my spirits. Come and sit. The doctor is going to say that I'm very sick. I want you to know what it means to be Lilwat. I want you to know the land and people are one. Kukshnam Kalap. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. Thank you. Um, next up tonight is Hapo Leung, and she works as a set designer in theater and film and TV productions, but she didn't grow up with a, a dream of working in theater. Um, <clears throat> she was artistic, always drawing and making things with her hands when she was a kid, but she wasn't aware of actual jobs related to this artsy doodling that she was doing. The only art-related occupation she knew of involved cutting off one's ears, starving, committing suicide, and gaining fame only after death. A bit bleak, she thought. She never treated her artistic inclinations seriously enough to take them further. Yet in 2014, Hapo decided to leave her beloved Hong Kong to attend a theater design master's program in Vancouver. She cried on the first night of arrival, missing her family so much and started to doubt that decision. It has been an exciting journey for her though. Uh, Hapo looks forward to an uncertain future like an audience gets excited about what is happening behind the curtain before it opens. So just a few pieces of trivia about Hapo. One, she has an Eeyore in her car and it's buckled in all the time. She loves the smell of fabric softener dryer sheets and after they've been used and they still got some scent in them, 
Um, she can't let them go, and she collects them in a pile and folds them nicely and puts them literally everywhere, in her car, inside her pillowcase, in her coat pockets. So if you smell that, you know where it's coming from tonight. Um, she created her name Hapo with one of her best friends based on one of the main characters named Poe in Teletubbies. The red, the red one, the short one. Um, so please give a warm welcome to Hapo. everyone. Um, okay. I'm super nervous at the moment, so I may just read it off from my slides. I hope that's okay. I will try to look up as much as possible, but yeah, so. Um, so, uh, here's me, and uh, okay, so here's my script. So, um, I, uh, my name is Hapo. I'm a freelance set designer in theater. And um, I also work full time in the TV and movie industry. And um, I would begin to just telling a little bit of my background and how I started my career a couple of times and ended up here in Vancouver um, doing theater. So um, I grew up in Hong Kong and moved to Vancouver around four years ago uh, for school. I studied the MFA, well, um, um, Jenna just mentioned. Um, I studied at the MFA program in theater and started working as a designer around two years ago. So um, growing up, I actually had zero background in theater. Like I didn't know anything about it and I didn't really go to live performance at all. And it's, I think I probably wasn't like into, like, it's not that I was not interested in it, it's just more like I was not exposed to that side of the world yet. So um, back then, like my knowledge of art and different type of art was like really limited. Um, the definition of art to me was more like just about painting. Like I didn't know anything else. I enjoyed the drawing and doing my like the little crafty things and I would go to drawing classes, but it kind of just was it. And um, so I, I didn't really go further. I always had this notion in my mind that making art equals to being poor. And, um, and my dad loved it to share stories of different painters to me. And his all time favorite was like frequently retelling the story of the life of Van Gogh. And now I think about it like, yeah, I think he probably like did it on purpose to scare me away from art. But then every time when he was telling the story when I was a kid, I thought to myself that like being a talented artist is just so sad, so pathetic. Like I don't want to be a starving artist. So yeah, so I kind of just developed this idea that I like art, um, but it will only be my hobby. I want no career in art. So no art, um, oh, yeah, so no art, <laughs> but still, I needed to figure out something for a living. And uh, by the time I go to college, um, I just picked sociology because I've been told that like 60% of the people who picked sociology, um, they go to law school after. And law sounded like really promising to me at that time. And my parents have never like so agreed with me and so I feel like it's probably like a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, so since then, Law kind of just became like um, my new buddy, but that relationship didn't last long. I got my first job at a law firm after I graduated. It was around the time after the collapse of Lehman Brothers. So, um, and the law firm I worked as specialized in bankruptcy. So you could imagine like we got tons of business, but we, but we also got like so many upset clients. Um, the workload was so heavy, so repetitive, and just the whole work environment was so depressing. I, I, I was so unhappy there. And almost like every day was a struggle. I was so stressful. Um, so one of the, like, in one of those days, I just called up my friend and say, like, I just want to get out from here. Let's just go out tonight. So um, we went and crashed at this party at my friend's place, uh, in, in my friend's neighborhood around. And this party actually played a crucial role in my life of helping me to find my passion, I think. Um, I remember it was a lovely house and the host seemed pretty, you know, 
stylish and wild. And we started drinking and chatting. And she was complaining about the, um, the layout of her home. Um, but I was like, are you crazy? This looks just perfect. It looks really beautiful to me. And she was like, oh, you don't know. Like, if I move this couch to here, if I move to, you know, something to there, then it would look way better. So, um, and I wasn't sure if she was drunk or she was actually that spontaneous, you know. So all of a sudden, in the middle of the party, she started to rearranging furniture. And yeah, and I'm talking about like big pieces of furniture, not just moving a chair. She was like moving like dining table and, and just, yeah, it was just like, um, and the place after just looks completely different. And I almost thought that I was at a, you know, different house. I might actually exaggerate that a little bit because I was a little bit tipsy back then. So I, I'm not sure, but something like that, right? Yeah, so, um, but the whole experience of like watching her um, doing all this was really mind blowing to me. Because um, to me back then, furniture doesn't move. Like I know furniture could move, but it also like doesn't move because our furniture at home, like at my parents' place, they never moved. Like as long as I could remember, like they, are, they were always at the same place. They were like there for like a practical reason. So moving furniture was like an alien idea to me. And um, so what the host done kind of shocked me, it just kind of triggered some part of my brain. And I realized space is actually very fluid, dynamic and really flexible. Um, and it could be transformed in so many different ways. Um, so not too long after that party, I started to taking a part-time interior design course and to just learn more about it. Um, and I started to really, really like it. Um, but how I actually started a design career, it's one day I just find out that the interior design instructor actually owns an interior design firm. And I was like, how convenient is that? So, and the pay of like an interior designer isn't so bad. So I started to kind of just back him, became friends with him, and I sort of just like persuaded him to hire me in his firm. So that's how kind of I restarted my career and began my um, design journey. But where did like theater design come into place? I'm almost there. <laughs> um, I think interior design kind of just confirmed that I like space planning, but I also thought that something was missing there. Um, I learned a lot in that interior design firm. It trained my eyes for details and improved my design skills. And I also started to get more exposure to different forms of art because we would go to like art exhibitions and events to like buy art for the clients. Um, but then, so it, I was actually pretty happy over there. Um, but then there's one thing that was bugging me. I always think that the signing space, um, whether it's for interior, theater, or movie, it all kind of come down to create a space that would affect people's mood, emotion in a certain way. But then I found that in interior design, it mainly kind of focus on enhancing people's positive emotions in an environment. So it's more like relaxing, happiness, like more like the positive side. It never really touches the negative side. Like you wouldn't really typically like design or have an opportunities to design something that create negative moods, like depressed, distressed, or intimidate, like those kind of things for a home or for a hotel. Like you don't really get those chances, right? Um, but I found myself like really interested in those area. So <laughs> um, I'm interested in a narrative approach to making space and to connect people to a wider range of emotions. So I had this idea that something more dramatic or more theoretical may be more suitable for me. Um, but I was actually like 27, 28 at that time. So the idea of like restarting again another career uh, was actually a bit frightening to me. And of course, I'm sure my parents were not like very fond of my idea. So, um, so I, I, I have a little hesitation, but then I always have this motto, is that how you say it? Motto, M-O-T-T-O, 
<laughs> sorry, uh, on my desk. So it says ships in harbor are safe, but that's not what ships are built for. And I feel like it really speaks to me. And so at the end, I kind of just took this adventurous step and quit my job, came to Vancouver and study theater design. Um, so why um, Vancouver specifically for theater? It's like a whole lot of like combination of different reasons. So I probably don't have time to like talk about all this tonight, but <laughs> I wanted to share a little bit about how I was able to get into the MFA program in theater without any theater background. Um, so first, of course, I tried to put together a portfolio um, as related to theater as I could. Um, but before I actually um, even applied to the program, I actually flew all the way from Hong Kong to here to meet the department head to just ask for his advice. Um, so now I look back at my uh, portfolio, it's actually, it's not too bad, but it's, it's not that impressive. But I think um, it was the in-person contact with the faculties like the attitude to actually show them how sincere I was about like learning theater was like kind of like a key factor. Um, so the photo behind me, this one over here, is the first complete model I have ever done for theater. Um, it was for the Midsummer Night's nice Dream. And um, I remember I was struggling so much of like how to fully understand a Shakespeare's script. Um, cause English is not my first language, apparently. And I will have <laughs> both the Chinese version and the modern English, English translation like side by side to the script and literally took one line at a time to make sure I completely understood the meaning. And, uh, and, and just because like it's not my na native language, sometimes I would just need to spend like extra time in recognizing and understanding those metaphors and puns in the script. Um, especially if it's a comedy play or if it's a play related to politics, um, like to completely gra grasp the <laughs> culture reference is actually quite challenging to me. Um, so I would just like to show a few photos of um, one of the concept design that I designed it for a play called The Skin of Our Teeth. Um, this play talks about the history of mankind um, through a story of one family who lived through timeless catastrophes like New Ice Age, flood and war. Um, so the time is really compressed and scrambled in this play. And sometimes the characters will like address the audience directly or even to the backstage um, crew. So it's pretty interesting. Um, so this play kind of starts and wraps around the same location. So the idea of this design is to have different settings and elements of scenes all put into this constant moving role in a certain order and kind of just moves along with the storyline. Um, and at, at the end, it kind of comes back to where it starts. Um, it symbolized like a circle of life, time switching back and forth, and also about like deconstruction and reconstruction. Because there's a really strong message in the plate about um, repeating history, um, reconstruct uh, deconstruction and rebuilding of humanity. Um, this design stated at the conceptual stage, it never got built, but I really hope one day like it will. Um, some of my favorite, like, not some, sorry, one of my favorite parts of like designing theater is in the pre-production uh, stage of doing research and finding inspirational pictures. Um, these are some of the inspirational pictures I came across while designing. I always go to these type of like installation art and sculpture to look for um, inspiration. I found that they somewhat like kind of share a similar nature of like creating three dimensional space. And I always love to see how they interpret things in an abstract way and what makes a thing a thing. Like if, if something looks like it stares, 
um, like how to like like what makes stairs like to be perceived as stairs? Like if they look like a stairs, but they're actually leading to nowhere or leading to the ceiling, like are they still stairs? Like I love to explore and think about these type of things. And um, it's not like in TV or film that you could always like prep a set before the camera. So sometimes change of a set in theater happens just in one second to another. It could be like really, really fast, really, really fluid. So I'm particularly interested in exploring the abstract representation of things and how to use them in theater. So um, these are some of the uh, fo show photos of uh, some theater productions I have designed before. And um, to wrap this up, I just wanted to mention a little bit about the challenges I have while working as a set designer in theater. Um, I remember before I graduated, my supervisor asked me if I have any financial pressure and if, um, if, if so, like, should I, uh, and if I have some financial pressure, I should really think about a side job on top of like set design. Um, because what usually happens is you kind of have to work for 10 shows for free before you can actually land on one that it's pay. And he was totally right. Like my first gig I got was just helping out on a small show um, who couldn't really find a set designer in time. So I was there and it was just kind of convenient. I took it, I done it for free and, um, and for the experience. But then I thought to myself like, oh my gosh, like it kind of just goes back to the beginning of why I don't want to be morphed in art because I don't want to be a starving artist, right? <laughs> but yeah, but then there I was, I was just really struggling. I, I just wasn't able to like sustain my, the life that I want by only working in theater as a new designer. Um, so very soon I started to work full time in TV and movie, which basically, like a lot more <laughs> and now theater kind of just becomes my freelance job and um, uh, I'm actually so glad that both industry like TV uh, movie theater they kind of just share similar skill sets so um, by working on both like it kind of just helps me to understand things in different perspectives but I always wonder like whether someone needs to focus on one thing um, in order to work your best? Or should I try to balance like both of them? So I, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure. Um, but then I kind of believe if you don't put enough of time on something, it just won't be as good. Um, and, and I also have to like my full-time job, it's more like my priority because I always run into a situation of where I got a really exciting theater gig, but just because it pays very little. So I still have to keep my full time, so it would be my priority. I just, I just couldn't fully commit to a gig as much as I want. So it's a bit sad there, but then I'm sure it's not just me. It's, it's, I feel like it's a lot of aspiring artists. They will encounter the same problem of how to be able to feed themselves while also working on something that they are passionate about. So this is more like a um, open-end question that I'm exploring myself as well. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to say before I go, it's I'm really grateful for this opportunity to be here, share my little humble story. I was so excited, but also like really, really nervous at the time, like when I received the invitation from Kenji and Mark. And uh, I was um, I was like, okay, I can't do it. Like I'm, I suck at public <laughs> speech. So I was like so scared. But then um, Mark, um, so he told me, he was like, just go up there, be yourself, like be honest and you'll be fine. So I think that really helps me to get through this whole process. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. So finally, um, and thank you, Hapo, that was amazing. Um, finally, we have Landon Krentz. And Landon Krentz is a bilaterally profoundly deaf individual who is completely bilingual in American Sign Language and English. 
As a deaf artist, he brings a unique perspective to the role of a director of artistic sign language for theater organizations that want to establish professional sign language theater as an inclusive artistic practice. The role has allowed him to advocate for the inclusion of artists within the larger community so that deafness is looked upon as a reflection of diversity and culture. He is a skilled ASL English transcriber who understands the theat theatrical context um, into sign language. In 2018, Landon was giving, given an award of merit for his work in inclusion and access in Vancouver. So a few pieces of trivia about Landon. One, he is working on the world's first ASL opera. Um, secondly, he runs an artistic sign language agency for ASL interpreting bookings and services. And third, he is single and available. Oops, it's not a dating event, but we passed that one along anyway. So please give a warm welcome to Landon. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now you've gotten a little taste of sign language and I'm obviously uh, not a ghost. There are interpreters here and those are the voices that you hear. So I'm very excited to be here and share my story with you and have an opportunity to share a little piece of my experience with you. You know, theater tends to be very traditional and conservative. And for me to have access to that community, I require interpreters. And not very often are they there. So I don't get to go to the theater very often. I'm very limited in my opportunity and my choices. So I grew up in Saskatchewan in a community there that was uh, quite tiny. I was uh, language deprived which means I didn't have access to sign language. I wasn't allowed to sign. There's a lot of fear that, um, you know, are reasons for why I was language deprived. The School for the Deaf had already closed in Saskatchewan at that time, and the deaf community had dispersed. So I hadn't had an opportunity to develop that piece of my cultural identity yet as a deaf person. And I really think it's important to talk a little bit about how deaf culture has influenced today in terms of um, telephones, text, those designs come from deaf people. Deaf people were the first people to pick up texting and now it's mainstream. And I think it's time that deaf culture and hearing culture work together and collaboratively when it comes to theater. When I moved here to Vancouver, I wanted to be involved with the deaf community, but I didn't really have any ASL skills yet. And it's not something that you can pick up overnight. So it is definitely my right as a deaf person to be involved. I had to earn my right as a deaf person to be involved in the deaf community. And again, it often comes with overlapping um, identities and pieces of culture and, and things that you grew up with. And I do wanna tell you a little bit about my artistic process tonight. And so I wanted to share a little bit about you. So I have a short little script here that I'm gonna show you. And so as a deaf artist, what happens is you look at a script that's frozen in frozen English text. And then you have to take that script and how do you incorporate that into ASL? There's no formal training here in Canada. I'm very fortunate that I have been able to have access to grants and travel um, internationally to different theater companies and uh, gain my experience that way. Before I start, I want to explain a little bit about um, 
what I have just been working on. I just had a conference called Awakening Deaf Theatre in Canada. It was the first of its kind. And it included four languages, English, French, ASL, and LSQ, which is the sign language used in Quebec. There are over 300 signed languages universally, globally, and all accompany the different cultures that they are from. I've often not been given a chance to try or have access to opportunities as many hearing artists do. So my role that I have here in a company I've started is a director of artistic sign language. And what I wanna do is collaborate with hearing artists and I want to use both spoken language and ASL collaboratively in theater including intersectionality. And the reason I want to collaborate is because I do notice in my work that often when communities are brought together, they learn to value each other more. You know, often you'll hear, see people who see sign language for the first time and they are fascinated by it. They're so, they, you know, they think it's so beautiful and amazing and often that comes from seeing music interpreted. And so I had started my career that way by interpreting music and I had a YouTube channel. It's a lot of work, let me tell you. When I read a script, it is a lot of work because English is a very linear language. And so as a hearing actor, you study the script and then you incorporate that and you then say the words. But to take a linear language and translate it into a 3D signed language, I'll give you an example here. So we're going to get the interpreters to go ahead and read it, blah, blah, blah. So it's gray. The platform is packed with business commuters, suits, overcoats. There is such a lack of color, it is almost seems as if it's a black and white shot, except one commuter holds a bright red heart-shaped box of candy under his arm. So I haven't practiced this, but I want to show you a little bit of what my um, process looks like as a deaf artist. So I would begin by reading this, and what I'm going to get you to do is watch me. The interpreters are going to turn off their voices. It's going to be challenging, everybody. So was that all that interesting? Was it riveting? I don't think so. I think we can improve upon that. So now I'm going to restart, if you will. Now that I have the context and the background of that piece, I'm gonna show you what my process is. So I think I'm ready. So the interpreters are gonna turn off their voices again.
Very different, hey? So, thank you. Thank you so much. It's much more visual. You know, there's a visual element added to that piece. You know, my first interpretation was dull, it was flat. You know, I don't think that a hearing audience would be able to understand that. It had no impact. And so that's just a, a small idea of what the process looks like for a deaf artist when they take a linear script and then translate that into ASL, how you make that come alive. You know, for example, with the red heart-shaped box, what's the definition of that? What's the metaphor behind the red heart-shaped box? You know, globally, I think it's very visual, the idea of black and white, of plainness, of that sort of uh, conformity. And I think that, you know, you need to tease out the metaphor and you need to tease out the character in the piece and you need to take that approach. The deck actor becomes the story while the hearing actor is the character. It's a very different approach. And so this is not something that's done quickly. You know, and I think that that's sort of the mic drop of the deaf artist, if you will. So thank you so much. So what we'll do now is we'll try to get a conversation started. Um, 20 minutes isn't a huge amount of time for me to get full answers from these people. So I'm gonna start with just firing out some questions about our theater scene here in Vancouver and with maybe this idea of restart too. And then hopefully we can get the conversation going in the room. Um, so I'm gonna throw you guys a curveball right off the top. We have a very unique theater scene here. And I wonder if you guys can give me one or two descriptives of the way you think it's unique. How would you describe this theater scene to somebody from outside, somebody from Toronto, about what makes it different? <laughs> Landed? Limited. What's that? Limiting. Limiting. Mm-hmm. Yvonne? Community-based. Mm -hmm. And hey, is that just one sentence? Um, oh, well, <laughs> do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, I feel like it's a hidden gem. This has just not been discovered yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you discovered. Um, before I get into some of the challenges, I, I read a little bit of challenge into, we do have problems here, but we have great things too. Before we get into that, I want to ask each of you um, either what show you're really looking forward to on a Vancouver stage this year, this season, or if, if that's not the case, something you just saw that's really great. Hey, Po, do you want to start? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on this show called The Great Leap. Um, it's for Arts Club. And next year, it runs in May. So I'm really looking forward to that show because it's, um, it's, I, I don't really often get a chance to do this kind of show. It's a show um, kind of roots um, some Chinese like culture and stuff. So I think it would be really interesting. And I'm super excited. And it's it. in May. It's in May. May? Yes. Yeah, we'll, yes, we'll May. be looking for Arts that Club. one. <laughs> Yvonne? Anything stand out? I just recently saw the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime at the mm -hmm. arts club. I really enjoyed the ensemble work. Did anyone see it here? Yeah, yeah, it was great. And Landon? To be honest with you, I don't have a lot of options to go to the theater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I did get an opportunity to see The Tempest. Tempest? And that was um, very fortuitous for me to be able to see that. It was great. So they had, they had ASL interpretation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Lots going on. So um, uh, those are some of the great things going on. Um, 
I want to dig into a little bit about the challenges. Hey, Paul, I know you, you talked about money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's an obvious one. Um, maybe I'll, I'll go through the group right now and, and just talk about what to you is sort of the biggest challenge of the scene here. Do you want to start with that one, Landon? Because I think we might know what's coming. <laughs> Well, I'm beginning my own journey to develop an ASL opera. And so I am partnering with hearing artists, how we can collaborate with deaf artists, how we can marry those two together. And so I'm investing a lot of time with individual artists to make that piece happen. Uh, so it's over to you. Oh, sorry. What if, oh, oh, no, I, I just want to follow up on that. So you're almost coming up with a new, you're almost creating a new model for working. Exactly. What I am hoping to do is provide hearing artists uh, with a background in deaf culture and apply that piece for them and then I'm going to translate that music and sign it slowly and then sign it faster and make sure that that piece can then be collaborated into American Sign Language so that it can be both auditorily and visually enjoyed. So mm -hmm. it's going to be a new kind of theater. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it will be very new. Yvonne? Um, I am writing a play that hasn't really happened yet. So um, one of the challenges in, in developing the script is that I'll have uh, one character in, in my first language, but I want to leave the framework of the English story the same and allow other First Nations communities to insert their language. So it gives people the freedom to explore how you would say or translate a story. Um, so that's my long-term, that's my long-term vision. So finding the people to have the communication with to, to keep this moving forward um, without sponsorship is, is is quite challenging. So I feel like the conversation is very limited. And um, first I have to follow protocol and share the story with my entire community before moving forward. So that is limita limiting for me because it is new, but it's ex also exciting because it is new. Right, but in both your cases, you're you're treading new ground, and you're both trying to sort of bridge languages, which I find really fascinating, the similarities between what both of you are trying to do. And I think it's really unique because we both seem um, kindred in that it's not hard. The language is not hard. It's beautiful. So it's easy. Right. And people who don't know it can find it beautiful, too, right. in both cases. Yes. Hey, Bo, what do you think is your sort of biggest challenge that you're facing right now in the theater scene? Um, I already talked about earlier. It's yeah. about money. So I don't really have another big challenge. Okay, that is but the then, biggest thing. <laughs> yeah, but then I actually wanted to say something good about the theater that we have in here. Yeah. I found it like um, there's a lot of really passionate people out there. So I almost feel like if you have an idea, if you wanted to do it in Vancouver, you almost um, certainly would get a crew to help you. Like I feel like the people in here, like you just kind of have to reach out to them. They are there, like, but then I feel like um, it's a community, it's a society that it's not always about money actually. Like I'm from Hong Kong, like Hong Kong is so commercial. Like everybody talks about money. And so to me, I feel like here it's less about that. So people are more just like, they concern more just about the life, the art, the, than just money. Right, so. and they're open to ideas and mm -hmm. it may, you're making it sound like um, they're like self-starters. People can get yeah. things created here mm -hmm. if you find the right people. 
and they are there. Yeah, you just kind of have to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the case of sets, does money affect that too, hey, Bo? Do you oh, have yeah, to be absolutely. really realistic about that? Yeah, yeah. I've been like offering like just a couple of hundred dollars or maybe just no money to create a set. Like, how do you do <laughs> oh, that? <no. laughs> so um, it's really challenging, but I almost feel like um, less money doesn't mean it's less like creative. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. sometimes if you have no money, you kind of just have to push your envelope to be creative. So like if it's a lot of money, it might be just like really fancy things, but it doesn't mean the minimal design, it's less creative, I feel like. Right. Yeah. That's when you really get creative, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Um, at this point, do we want to see if there's a question here as part of the audience? Mm -hmm. Down here. Mark, Mark's going to bring you the uh, yeah, microphone. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, yes. Thank yes. You. Okay. So I'm just curious. First of all, I find it heartbreaking that so little theater is accessible. That that just kills me. That it's 2018. I mean, and and just hearing your experience, I'm like, the Milan Convention was 130 years ago. What the heck was going on in your town where you were not given language? That okay. I'm going to be like thinking about that for two weeks or more. Anyway, so I'm just wondering who is providing for the deaf community? That's what I want to know in theater in Vancouver. Who's doing it? And what is the preferred method? Is it super titles? Is it live interpretation? Is it both? Well, the theater company themselves tend to be the ones responsible to provide interpretation. But the challenge is that they don't provide that access from the beginning. Often they'll hire the interpreters last minute because of budgetary constraints. And it's an afterthought. It's not part of the production or the process. And so it has to be a part of the process. And so that's part of what I do as a deaf consultant. I have theater experience. I have experience with the translation process. And that's part of what I would do. And you worry about the interpretation piece later. My preferred mode of communication, I honestly hate watching the interpreter because they're not part of the piece. They're off to the side. They're this secondary uh, thing that isn't really part of the theater itself. And so it, it, it doesn't really work that well. You know, if you really wanted to make theater inclusive, I think that the language needs to be part of the theater itself. It needs to be part of the experience. And I think we can definitely improve on that part. Thank you for asking. It's just making me think about a word that I hear bandied around a lot in the theater community right now, and that's inclusion. And I would love to hear what, how you guys define that, what's real inclusion, because it's a word that's used a lot. Yvonne, do you want to maybe talk about that first? Do you have ideas on that? Um, integrity has a lot to do with it. You could have your own personal integrity, but someone else's definition of integrity can be entirely different. So before you even come to the space, you need to have a dialogue about shared integrity. So inclusivity to me means that at no part in the process will I exclude you. Hey, Bo, do you have any ideas about that? Or? Um, I don't think I have any particular. I, I, I must feel like we are working on it. Like, and there's like so many things like also happen in Hollywood. I feel like the society kind of know about like inclusive and then just bringing it up. And yeah, I think 
people are working. It, it feels like it's happening. Yeah, it's a happening. Bit. Yeah, that's a little bit. Word. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Landa, do you want? What does inclusivity kind of mean to you in a more general way? I noticed that the theater community will hire interpreters, but they don't consult the deaf community first. So by hiring interpreters, they feel like they're being inclusive, but that's not really the case. There's no collaboration with the deaf community itself. There's no consultation with the deaf community, and I think that that's imperative. I think that that needs to be included. You know, I think it parallels with the idea, uh, as oddly as it sounds, of barbecue. You know, if you have a piece of meat and you're putting it on a grill, it's not really much if it's just put on the grill. But if you take that meat and then you season it and you add to it, it becomes a, a beautiful dish. And I think that's the same sort of idea. It needs to be a holistic approach. We mean to meet halfway. We, it needs to be collaborative. And I think what would stem from that would be magical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I heard Yvonne saying too. Um, is there another question? Mm -hmm. Over here. Who's closest with the mic? Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge. My experience going to theater is that half of the audience tends to be uh, people who are 50 plus. But yet we have very few plays which are of elders, like here play like Wedding for Kudo or something, where the actors and the, are elderly and the stories are about elderly people. Do you have any comments on, in terms of inclusiveness of having more plays? Why are there not many plays with, with seniors or elders? I know some people complain the elders can't listen because they're half deaf or they can't memorize the lines. But I don't agree with that because I'm 70, I can hear you. <laughs> Yvonne? Uh, Aunt Celia is, um, uh, I, I wrote Aunt Celia in her late 70s, but I, I, I didn't want to give voice to my grandmother because I just wanted her to rest in peace. And so, um, Someone asked me why I didn't have my fluent speakers um, act out the part. One, because I was stingy and wanted to speak my language. And two, because the crafted experience of having a, an emotional and psychological journey, I wanted to be gentle on my elders. And so that's why I chose to play my Aunt Celia. Anyone else? I absolutely am grateful to my elders for teaching me language and for teaching me artistic integrity. And I would never do my work alone. I would always consult with other people in my community who had more experience than me, um, you know, communicate with my elders and people. I would always collaborate on any piece I worked on. Um, we, we have time for one last question before we break tonight. It went so quickly. Would, is there any last question from the house someone would like to ask? There's one over there. Kenji, behind you. I'm just curious, uh, uh, Landon, you, you were, I think, you were a part of the, tr the training um, team for PUSH and the Fringe Festival, uh, who had some uh, attempts at uh, uh, putting together accessible theater. What was your opinion of that? The irony is that I have worked with both, and it's been a different experience. I didn't have a positive experience with the PUSH Festival, to be honest with you. I, I definitely think that perhaps their intention was there, 
but the challenge was that the deaf community needs to be more involved. And I feel that the process never really went anywhere. I definitely have seen some improvement with the Fringe Festival and their work and their collaborative piece as they've gone along. And so I definitely feel that that was a more successful collaboration. Interestingly, the, the Fringe Festival has sort of a new mandate where they talk about being real about inclusivity and really going deep with it. Um, does anyone else want to add anything else before we go tonight? Move on, no one? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, go, go. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, please remember that Creative Mornings is here to serve you. Um, it's your event, the Creative Community event. And, um, it's beyond a moment to gather for breakfast, or in this case, for the evening. And hopefully we've learned something. Um, I know that I've learned something from every single one of the speakers here tonight that I will definitely take into my work. Um, and together we can just sort of build the capacity of this thriving creative economy that we've got here in town. Um, and I just wanted to um, remind you about this. Um, if you have feedback, comments, ideas, anything, would you like to get involved? Uh, please use these avenues to do so. And they, as they said, they, they welcome everyone. And thank you all for coming out to this tonight um, and have a great evening.